The Aggies have a ton of talent on the 2023 roster. The question is, who's going to break out? You are Locked On Aggies, your daily podcast on the Texas A&M Aggies. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome on in the Locked On Aggies. I'm your host, Andrew Stefaniak. Thanks for making Locked On Aggies your first listen every single day. Before I get into today's first topic, I do want to say those of you who are interested in baseball and that stuff, we're going to talk about that at the tail end of today's show. So stick around and we will talk about the Aggies run in the SEC baseball tournament. But the first thing we're going to talk about today is this 2023 football roster has got a ton of talent, like I said in, in our little intro here, but Who's going to be the player that steps up and breaks out for this football team? I have a handful of names on offense and a handful of names on defense. I'm going to talk about all these guys, tell you why I think that they could be a potential breakout player, and then tell you who my breakout is on each side. That's how we're going to break this all down. So first guy on offense is Bryce Foster. I think Foster is going to have a good year on the offensive line, and I think he's going to be a big reason why this offensive line is much improved in 2023. And it kind of feels like a necessity for Foster to be better because if the offensive line isn't good, this football team is not going to be good. And I I think that's a reality. The offensive line, I think, is one of the most important positions behind the quarterback simply because if, if you're letting the defenders run through you and around you and – tackle the running back in the backfield or sack your quarterback, you're not going to move the football. The offensive line has to give the quarterback time and has to create holes for the running game. And Foster's going to be a big part of that. I think he's going to be the general. I think he's going to be the one of the best offensive linemen. It, I, no, I'll go as far as say I think he will be the best offensive lineman this year for the Aggies. And I think he has to be. If the Aggies don't have a good offensive line, this team's going to struggle. If they do have a good offensive line, I think this team could be outstanding because the weapons are there. I think Wegman's improvement is going to be crazy this season. The offense as a whole has a lot to be excited about, but the offensive line has to give those players a chance to shine. I think it will, but that's going to be one of the big keys to the season, and I think Foster's going to be a player that breaks out, and if he doesn't, we need to worry, but he's going to. I'm just put. I'm right. I'm putting it out in the earth. Foster's breaking out this season. Next guy I have down here is Ruben Owens. Um, I've talked a lot about him. You all know that I'm a big Ruben Owens fan. Ruben Owens fan, and we'll talk about all three running backs here because I actually have all three down. Owens, of course, is a true freshman. The other two, Amari Daniels and Le'Veon Moss, both got work last year behind a chain. Not a ton of work, but some work. So they've played SEC football before. They have been out there, and they you know, have definitely learned the speed of the game, and they've been in the weight room. So they have that to their advantage. One of these three players is going to be the breakout running back. So I've said that in Coach Petrino's offense, there's going to be multiple running backs getting work, getting carries, moving the football on the ground. That's a guarantee. The question is, which of these guys is going to be the main guy, the guy getting all the work. I think at the beginning of the season, it's going to be Daniels and Moss, but I think come week five, six, later than that, I think Owens might take over. And I think he's got, I think his talent, all three of these running backs have different styles, but I love what Owens is able to do. He's he's more of a, he, he can make cuts, he can make you miss. He, he, he has a great vision on the field, and I think he's going to succeed in college football quickly. I don't think it's going to take him long to adjust to the college game as it might take a defensive lineman or a linebacker. I think he will adjust quicker than many other positions and even many other running backs. So Owens, if I had to pick who who's going to be the breakout running back, I'm going Owens, even though I don't think he's going to be the main guy when we start the season. Next guy I got here is Noah Thomas. One of my first episodes, I talked about the receiving game and I did not talk. I, I asked the question, Who's going to be the leading receiver for the Aggies? I inevitably came down to the answer, Evan Stewart. My opinion on Noah Thomas does not change that answer, but I do think 
that Noah Thomas is going to have an insanely good season. I love his frame. I kind of forgotten that he was a big guy. You know, he's of course six foot six. Um, I'm a big fan of taller receivers, and I think him being a tall receiver, it just I like what I like about his ability is that he's not just a 50-50 ball winner. He can do that. I think we see a lot of big receivers, and everyone's knee-jerk reaction is, oh, man, we can throw him a fade route on the four-yard line. And I don't think that's the only thing Thomas has in his in his bag. I think he's a guy who can do it all. He's a, he, he can run crisp routes. He's, he's got some speed to him, and he can do things tall people are supposed to do when they play wide receiver. I think Thomas has a chance to be the number two receiver on this team. I'm not saying that's crazy. High. I, I'm not, I think that's a bold statement because I still think Smith and, and Muhammad have great seasons, but I think Thomas could do it. Um, and so he's one of my breakout candidates for sure. Donovan green tight end. You know, he, he put up some, so he, he was impressive his, his last season but there was definitely, you know, you saw him play and you're like, he could be special. It's a matter of, I, I think for him, it's a matter of if not when. And I'm sorry, a matter of when, not if. I said that backwards. Gosh. But you know what I mean? For for Green, I think it's a matter of when, not if. I think the talent is there. And I think the win could be this season. Um, I just, I think he's going to have a good year. I don't have much... I don't have much backing to that opinion. I just, I like the way he plays tight end. I like his ability on the field. And I think he makes this offense better. So Green's a guy, I think he's going to have a good season. Wegman I have on here, you know, I know he played in a handful of games last year, but I, even though he had some flashes, I don't think we could, we should sit here and say what he did last year was break out. And I think he is going to break out this year, but he's not my main offensive breakout just because I think we all expect Wegman to break out. I'm trying to have more deeper guys here. So those are the guys I have on offense. And the two guys that I'm going to say, I have two guys on offense and one on defense that are my picks to be the, the breakout guys for the Aggies. And on offense, it's Noah Thomas and Ruben Owens. I think Thomas is going to be awesome. And I think Ruben Owens is going to take over the backfield in the back half of the season. When it comes to defense, I only have three names, and two of them are transfers. And one of them I don't even – I think might not even start, but I think the talent is there. Tony Grimes is the player I have here, is the first player I have. Former North Carolina Tar Heel, former five-star recruit, started a few years for the Tar Heels, and, you know, he was great. He was, he was, he was, he was good. He was solid, but he's – you know, he left North Carolina looking for a new home and, and kind of a – uh, fresh start in college football. And I think he's he's got that fresh start in college station. And I think he's going to break out. I think he's going to have an awesome year. I think he's going to be a guy who could finish as a all SEC second team cornerback or all SEC honorable mention cornerback. He's going to be a, a really solid cornerback for the Aggies in 2023. And I think he just, he helps this defense a ton and you got him from the transfer portal. And I, I love the way Coach Fisher used the transfer portal this season. I think Grimes is a massive addition that is going to play a huge role for Texas a this season. Second guy is Sam McCall. I've seen him listed um, some places, you know, different depth charts. Like I have my own depth chart. Um, I've seen him listed as a backup some places. I've seen him listed as a starter some places. I don't think he starts off the season as a starter, but I do think he's going to play a role. And, you know, because you still got Chappelle and, of course, Grimes coming in. The, the, talent, the, the cornerback room's talented. But McCall's talented, too. He played in eight games last year for Florida State, his previous school. So both of these cornerback transfers are ACC guys. Um, and he had a good year. But he it just it wasn't the year many would have hoped. So um, I think he's going to have a good year this year if he gets the playing time. If he doesn't, I think his breakout could potentially be next season. Last guy on here is Walter Nolan. Walter Nolan is my pick to be the breakout candidate for the Aggies this season on defense. Uh, I, and like I said, I think he might be a guy who starts in the two deep and works his way into the starting lineup, but he's just a monster. I think he's going to be a nightmare for opposing offensive linemen, and I think you got to watch out for Walter Nolan this season. I'm excited to see what he can do. You all let me know who your all's breakout candidates are for the offense and defense this season, and I'm really curious to know what you all think there. Let's talk about a little bit of quarterback depth 
But first, I want to tell you about our friends at Built Bar. Built Bar protein bars, goodness gracious. I, I don't know what to say, but it, it's hard to talk about them. They are so delicious. These, these protein bars, they taste like a candy bar, but they're good for you. Listen to the numbers on them. Listen to the statistics on these, on these Built Bars. 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 17 grams of protein. Jam-packed with protein. That's a big deal. I, they're covered in chocolate. They taste great. They're good and good for you, which you can't say a ton about food. Please go give these Built Bars a try. You can find them at Sam's Club, Walmart, and, of course, at Built.com. Go give these a chance. You will not regret it. I want to talk a little bit about this quarterback room. And the reason that is, is there's something I noticed about Texas A&M's quarterback room that there's only a handful of SEC teams can say. And I think it's going to lead to some, it's going to lead to Aggie fans feeling a lot better about the 2023 season. So I'm going to talk a little bit about another SEC school when breaking down before I get into this. We're going to be talking about depth, quarterback depth, and why it's so important. The team is Kentucky because last season and this season, they had quarterbacks in Will Levis and, of course, Devin Leary, the former NC State quarterback who transferred to Kentucky, who's going to be their starter this season. Those two guys were top half of the SEC quarterbacks. I think Leary will be this year. Levis was last year. Levis was the year before that. And there was no backup. The backups were awful. Levis this season, he was dealing with injuries. He sat out a game, I believe it was against South Carolina, a game that Kentucky probably should have won. And they didn't because they had to play a backup quarterback who was terrible because Levis couldn't play. Quarterback depth is massive. Same thing for Leary this season over there at Kentucky. The backup is the same guy. Not very good backup. Probably one of the worst backups in the SEC If Leary goes down, this Kentucky team goes from a team that I think could win seven games to a team that's going to maybe win five or six. It's And Kentucky could be a team that could win seven, eight, or nine. I wouldn't be surprised with any of those numbers. If their quarterback goes down, no shot they get anywhere near that number. And the reason I I broke all that down about Kentucky is it's a problem that the Aggies aren't going to have. Wegman is going to have a breakout season. I think everyone can agree there. I think everyone's excited about what Wegman's going to do this season. And he he's a guy who he showed, like I said this when we talked about the breakout players, he shows flashes. It just kind of never all came together. I think it's going to all come together this year. But let's say one of these two things happen. Wegman's, Wegman goes down with an injury, or he's just doesn't break out and has a rough start to the season. Max Johnson is a capable backup quarterback, and having that is key in the SEC. People get hurt all the time. Imagine, I don't even remember now who the quarterback was. Was it JT Daniels that went down that let Stetson Bennett come in and take over? But imagine if there was no quarterback depth there. You know, Stetson Bennett comes in and wins back-to-back national championships. If there's no depth there, you're done for. And I think that the Aggies have a similar situation. They have a similar situation because their backup quarterback, Max Johnson, is a guy who can win football games in the SEC. He's played before at multiple different SEC schools, well, Texas A&M and LSU. So he's got the experience. Experience is key, and he's going to be a huge part of this team. And he might not even see the field. He might not touch it once. But at the end of the day, he lets the coaches sleep at night going, okay, if something happens with Wegman or if he doesn't take the leap we expect him to, we have a guy who can win us football games at the quarterback position. And not every SEC school, not every Power 5 school can say that. I think it's a big deal. And I think the other thing about this, you know, um, Coach Fisher made a statement, and it sounded a little bit coach speaky, you know what I mean? How We, we all know what coach speak is, where, you know, you know, the coaches say what – People want to hear whatever, but um, he talked about how these guys are competing for a starting role. Basically, you know, well, I haven't named Wegman the starter yet. We all know and believe Wegman's going to be the starter and Max Johnson is going to back him up. But I think if you're a guy, Connor Wegman, still a young quarterback, a young guy, when you hear that, it makes you say, okay, I can't let up in practice. I can't, you know, do two less bench press reps or, you know, get two less 
extra passes in at practice. It makes you work harder. You know, it makes you want to be a better quarterback, a better player, a better teammate every single day. That's what competition does. Competition elevates everything. So while Coach Fisher said that, and I don't think anybody in their right mind thinks Wegman's not going to be a starter, but I think when these guys hear that, Max Johnson and Wegman hear that, they say to themselves, man, I, so Max Johnson's thinking, I have a chance. Coach Fisher says I got a chance. And he's working hard at practice every day. What does him working hard every day at practice do? That makes Wegman work harder. And Wegman want to be better on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's why friendly competition is such a big deal. You know, everybody that's played a sport or done anything, you know, you want to move up in your job. You want to move up in football. You know, you got your rival. You got the guy that the, the guy or the person you got to be, you got to beat out, <laughs> whether it's at work or a sport or fantasy football, whatever it is. And so it's a situation I think everybody's been through in life. And, and so like me knowing that I think about playing sports my life, I, I can think about, oh, I was going to be the backup to this guy and I had to work hard to beat out this person. And I think knowing that it reminds me, okay, I remember I worked extra hard to put myself in that position, just like Max Johnson and Wegman are doing for the Aggies this season. And I think that just is going to be good for the off season since it's going to make both of these guys want to be better on a practice-to-practice, day-to-day, rep-to-rep basis. And I think it's going to lead to both of these guys being – got you know, Wegman being a guy who I think could be borderline elite and Max Johnson being a guy that if something happens to Wegman, he's there and can win you football games. This is a big deal. We can't sit here and – I can't sit here and explain how important this is because it just – it's a big deal having a guy that can go in and back up Wegman and win games if something happens. It's a good thing for the Aggies to have, and I'm really thankful that Texas A&M isn't in a situation like a Kentucky where if somebody goes down, your ship is sank. The Aggies' magical run in the SEC baseball tournament came to an end in the championship game against Vandy. Let's break it down. Yep. It was it was fun. It was fun and it's exciting. You know, hanging up a trophy is fun. Ah, I hate it for these players. I hated I hated them losing that game because they were a ten seed. They knocked off LSU. They knocked off um, Arkansas. They sent all these teams packing. They sent home Tennessee. They sent home teams that people imagine are going to be making their way to Omaha here in a couple weeks. So you hate that it ended the way it did in the championship game against Vandy, but let's talk about this game a little bit and then talk a little bit more big picture for the rest of the season for the Aggies as we get ready to play the regional round of the NCAA tournament. So in this game, 10-4 loss to the Commodores. The score makes it sound like it was, like a, uh, it was a close game. The score does not do this game justice. It was 5-4 to four in the bottom of the eighth inning. The Commodores scored five runs to take a 10 to 4 lead so at the time you know heading into that inning it was 5-4 Vandy they of course went on to score five runs in that inning to take a big lead the Aggies weren't able to put a rally together in the top of ninth ball game so what can we take away from this game it's not even really this game it just you know sometimes yeah it looks like the Aggies just kind of ran out of steam um one thing i took away that was exciting was when it was a two to four game. Texas A&M had a couple guys on base, first and second, with two outs. A pass ball, actually, would have been a wild pitch, got away from the catcher, and those two were able to advance. And then a base hit with two strikes brought the runners home to tie the game. And I think um, the reason that's a, a big takeaway from this game for me was two strike hitting and two out hitting is a big deal. I always call that the hit, the big hit is what I refer to a hit like that as, you know, two strikes, two outs to be able to knock in two runs when your team, when you, when your team's down two runs, that's a big hit. And that's why like leaving a whole bunch of guys on base, you just can't do it. You leave those two guys on base. It's a, it's a different ball game at that point in time of the game. Of course, it ended up being a bit of a blowout, but that was one of the positive takeaways for me. The Aggies walked five in this game, so a little bit better than last game, but still a number I'd like to get down another walk or two. But I like to see it progressively getting better. I'm pretty sure it went from eight to six to five between the three games. So I like seeing that number going down, 
but I'd still love it at the two to three range, worst case scenario four in the regional round. Um, so the the big the the other main takeaway from the SEC tournament is it locked the Aggies in as a two seed in the NCAA tournament. Uh, that's going to help. That's just going to help seeding. It's going to help, and I think they have a chance to be one of the higher two seeds because of this deep run. So locking up that two seed's a big deal. You know, you don't want to be a three seed. That's just you just don't want to be. So locking up the two seed's a big deal for the Aggies, and that's what they were able to do. And the other key takeaway here is just the momentum. Momentum's big in all sports. It's big in basketball, football, baseball. It's it's big in cornhole. I mean, it is in all reality. Momentum's a big deal everywhere. Confidence is a big deal in every aspect of life. And this Aggie bat, this Aggie baseball team has momentum heading into the NCAA tournament. That's a big deal. You know, you go into this tournament, you win your first game against whoever the three seed is in your regional, and then you find a way to knock off the number one seed wherever you head. That's a big deal. This momentum that the Aggies built during their time in Hoover that they collected with this little shopping, uh, not shopping cart, the little hotel luggage cart. I mean, the team chemistry, everything is going right for the Aggies right now, even though they dropped this game. And I don't think losing this game to Vandy changes anything about the outlook and how I feel for the rest of the postseason. I still think this team can make a run to Omaha. I don't think that's crazy. They're one of, they're one of the hotter teams in baseball after this run. So. Now let's talk about more of the big picture, where the Aggies head and stuff like that. This evening, it's Sunday night, currently for me while I'm recording, you all will be watching this on Monday. Sunday night, the regional hosts were just announced, so we know who the hosts are. Monday, we're going to find out where the Aggies are heading for their regional. D1 Baseball, they are the main baseball writers for college baseball, and they do an outstanding job for a sport that doesn't get the coverage, you know, the basketball, football gets. So what they do is a big deal, and it really helps these these baseball players get out, get, you know, get known and, and get read about and stuff like that. So I appreciate what they do for the sport of baseball. But they put out their list of the regionals and the field of 64, uh, basically, you know, like a bracketology like you see in NCAA basketball. So – they have Texas A&M heading to Oklahoma State to play in that regional where the Aggies would be the two seed, the USC Trojans would be the three seed, and Oral Roberts would be the four seed. So that means that the opening game of the regional would be Texas A&M versus USC. Two Power Five teams going at it in a fun ball game. You know, neither of them will be home in, in front of their home crowd. So that, you know, you got that even advantage there for it's no advantage for either team. Um, But like I say, this isn't official yet. That's just a projection. And frankly, that's a regional that I think the Aggies could go win. I think they could knock off Oklahoma state. Oklahoma state's a great baseball team and a great baseball program, but the Aggies are playing terrific baseball right now. They can go win this regional. Now, like I said, we're going to find out today. You know, I say today because like I said, you all are watching on Monday. We're going to find out today where the Aggies are heading, and then we'll break that down more. We'll look at some of the teams, look at some of the numbers, and we'll break it all down and see how we feel about where the Aggies are heading for their regional. But like I said, just, you know, tip your cap, tip your cap to this baseball team. Um, You know, a team that just didn't have the year many would have expected based on the preseason, based on the preseason uh, expectations. And the other th- person that needs a little hat tip is Coach Schloss. You know, what he did and the the ability to be able to fight through these in-game interviews. Now, that's a joke, but if you all haven't heard about that, it's hilarious. There's this – and it's not even like a – it's not even – it's like reality. Every time he gets interviewed during those one little in mid-inning interviews or during inning interviews, something bad happens for the Aggies, whether it's a dropped fly ball or a double in the gap. It just seems to happen every time, and it's becoming really funny. So that's my joke there. But – Coach Loss, all jokes aside, has done an outstanding job keeping morale high for this baseball team. It's a big deal. It's hard when you're you know, a preseason top 10 team and it just doesn't go the way you expect in the first couple weeks of the season. It's really hard to, to stay the course, and Coach was able to do that. He was able to keep this team in a position to where they're a team now that can make a run. And if you would have asked me a month ago, would that be the case? I think I would have said no. So – Really good job by this baseball team. Heck of a run, and I'm ecstatic to see what happens from here. Like I say, we will break down the brackets when we know it, where the Aggies are heading. We will break that down. 
when we know all that information. But that is going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Aggies. I really appreciate you all stopping on in and checking out what we got going on here. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I will see you tomorrow.